on September 8th, 1919, Woodrow Wilson sounded the warning. I can predict with absolute certainty that within another generation, there will be another world war. Unless the nations of the world concert the method by which to prevent it. 20 years later, almost to the day, a second world war burst on a stunned humanity. A bigger, costlier, more terrible war than the first. A war that finally led the civilized nations of the world to the very brink of extinction. In place of a future clouded with doom, which he foresaw and foretold, Wilson proposed an alternate course. A lasting peace, freedom for men, a world safe for mankind. The story of his life is a record of ceaseless struggle in behalf of these ideals of a better world. The peaceful, conservative campus at Princeton became one of his early battlegrounds when Wilson, the most popular professor, was named university president in 1902. His ideals, shaped in contemplation, were now put to a practical test. He soon launched a vigorous program of academic reform, declaring, Education should be a process of preparation, not a process of information. Students are to be citizens and the world's servants. He attacked Princeton's exclusive eating clubs as undemocratic barriers to learning. The excitement on campus echoed across the land as Wilson rejected the financial support of wealthy alumni rather than compromise his ideals. His leadership attracted national attention and local political bosses thought him an ideal figure for public office. With their support, he was elected governor of New Jersey in 1910. Then, to their surprise, the man they had thought a figurehead came to life. Wilson insisted on honest government and drove the crooked politicians from power. Two years later, out of the Democratic National Convention, the schoolmaster in politics emerged presidential candidate. In his election campaign, a new sense of life was stirring. He was a fresh player in a jaded game, vigorous, inspiring, honest. This is not a day of triumph. It is a day of dedication. Men's hearts wait upon us. Men's hopes call upon us. Who shall live up to the great trust? Who dares fail to try? Daring was the word for the 28th President of the United States. Under the banner of the new freedom, he responded to men's hearts and hopes. There is no such thing as corporate liberty. Liberty belongs to the individual, or it does not exist. He invited labor leaders to the White House, declaring, the right of labor to live in peace and comfort must be recognized by governments. He attacked monopolies, charging, honest American industry has always thriven on freedom. For his associates in government, Wilson repeatedly defined and explained their responsibilities. The commands of democracy are as imperative as its privileges. To safeguard these privileges, the scholar in the White House translated these commands into the liberal legislative program of the chief executive. The Underwood tariff reductions, the Federal Reserve System, the Federal Trade Commission, the Clayton Antitrust Law, and measures to aid farmers, reform credit, and guarantee labor's rights. Shattering precedent, Wilson went to Congress in person. And in place of the traditional inertia with which previous presidential messages were received, a packed joint session of both houses listened with amazed interest. 
I am very glad indeed to have this opportunity to address the two houses directly and to verify for myself the impression that the President of the United States is a person, not a mere department of the government. That he is a human being trying to cooperate with other human beings in a common service. Wilson concentrated his energies on the domestic scene, but his whole program of reform was suddenly threatened by a storm from abroad. War had exploded in Europe, igniting the whole continent. Hating war, Wilson resolved to avoid entanglement. He at once proclaimed American neutrality and pleaded with European leaders, urging them to end the incredible catastrophe. He offered to help them settle their differences across a conference table instead of a trench. In reply, American ships, even unarmed and in neutral waters, were attacked by German submarines. American public opinion was outraged, and demands for vengeance were voiced. But in Washington, Wilson stood firm on neutral ground. Nevertheless, he took steps to strengthen the nation's defenses and build up its armed forces. Meanwhile, the neutral ground was rapidly dissolving underfoot. In September 1916, when he was renominated, Wilson felt obliged to tell his listeners, No nation stands wholly apart when all nations are thrown into peril. By the beginning of his second term, his troubled thoughts reflected the effect of repeated German acts of aggression. As a warning, he announced to the world the principles for which America stood and for which Americans would fight. A month later, Wilson told a joint session of Congress, the right is more precious than peace, and we shall fight for the things we have always carried nearest to our hearts. God helping us, we can do no other. On April 6, 1917, Wilson declared war against Germany. Overnight, the teacher, scholar, and reformer had to shoulder the added burdens of leading a peace-minded nation into a great war. Under his inspiring leadership, the vast mobilization of men and material for the fighting fronts was rapidly accomplished. During these same months, he evolved a program of war aims to give real hope and meaning to the military struggle abroad. Presented to Congress on January 8, 1918, Wilson's 14 points provided a plan for a lasting peace by extending his ideals of liberty and justice to the peoples of the entire world. In Europe, the impact of countless reinforcements and endless supplies from America was increasingly felt at the fighting fronts. As the Allied pressure mounted, the tide of battle turned, and the Central Powers asked for an armistice. The world went wild with joy on November 11, 1918. This was the end of the worst war in history and everyone knew it would never happen again. People wouldn't permit it a second time. From the White House gate, the president watched the celebration, happy as everyone else. But unlike everyone else, he was worried. The war he had detested and resisted was over, won. Now, could he win the peace that would end all wars? Determined to spare no effort, he sailed for Europe, the first American president ever to leave the country during his term of office. In Paris, he was given a thunderous reception. All along the route, he was hailed by thousands of the friendliest strangers, people who couldn't quite pronounce his name, yet knew it well. Wilson felt they were cheering, not him, but his ideas. 
They were really cheering peace, freedom, a world safe for mankind. On Christmas Day, the Commander-in-Chief went calling. At posts in the Paris area, he inspected the billets and talked to his troops. They didn't tell him how much they missed their homes at Christmas, and he didn't let on that presidents also have worries. Instead, they told a few jokes and enjoyed themselves a little. It was a good visit. Two French boys from the town also paid their respects, with bouquets of well-chosen flowers and phrases. Then the president returned to Paris. The following day, Wilson crossed the channel to England, where he was again highly honored and acclaimed. Pleased by the personal greetings of King George V, Wilson was equally elated at the opportunity to cement allied friendship before the peace conferences. Toward this end, he delivered several stirring addresses in various parts of England, including the unforgettable words at his grandfather's church in Carlisle. It is moral force that is irresistible. It is the conscience of the world that we are trying to place upon the throne which others would usurp. Then Wilson returned to the continent, this time going to Rome. The enthusiasm that greeted him here exceeded even his earlier receptions. Somehow, this scholar and philosopher from the New World had stirred the hearts of the masses of Europe. The touching thing was that from the ends of the earth, from little pocketed valleys where I did not know that a separate people lived, there came men. Men of dignity and intellectual parts. And they came and sat at the feet of the youngest nation of the world and said, teach us the way to liberty. They came as individuals to inquire and to listen. But when they came to Versailles to draw up a plan for the peace, the dream of harmony was troubled by the gathering forces of discord. They came to Versailles, like Clemenceau, the Tiger of France, demanding vengeance. Vengeance was not on the program of Wilson's Secretary of State, Robert Lansing. They came from the Orient, seeking a share in the spoils of war. American General Bliss was not interested in spoils for the victor. In fact, his countryman, Herbert Hoover, was organizing relief for enemy and ally alike. The presence of an Indian delegate marked progress between the colony and the crown. Representing the crown was Prime Minister Lloyd George, chief of the British delegation. Diplomat pianist Paderewski represented a country that had disappeared three times in one century. Monsieur van der Neuvel came from Belgium, which had almost disappeared and the war just ended. And finally, architect of the plan for a reasoned new kind of peace, a peace that might hopefully endure, American President and Mrs. Woodrow Wilson. The conflicts reflected in the Great Hall of Mirrors were as broad and profound as the ocean between old world and new. In vain, Wilson invoked his 14 points. Open covenants of peace openly arrived at. His own allies had secret agreements. In vain, his promise. Absolutely impartial adjustment of all colonial claims. Colonial powers didn't share this view at all. His League of Nations European leaders regarded as noble but impractical. During a lull in the bitter debates, Wilson visited Belgium, symbol of all victims of aggressive force in the war just ended. Stirred by heartbreaking scenes of devastation, Wilson was determined to do everything in his power to prevent another war when he returned to Versailles. He fought stubbornly to stop the selfish interests of national rivalry, but he was fighting against hopeless odds and he was forced time and again to compromise. On the main point, however, he stood firm. He insisted on universal acceptance of his covenant for a League of Nations. 
a general association of nations for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small nations alike. On June 28, 1919, the Big Four announced the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. The Big Four, Lloyd George, Orlando, Clemenceau, and Wilson, turned out to be four older, very tired men. Faced with insoluble conflicts, they had struggled to unsatisfying compromises. The rest was up to history. Determined to salvage what he could, Wilson prepared to go home. His solemn, lonely departure contrasted bitterly with his fervent reception only a few months earlier. Champion of the hopes of so many people, he was now blamed for the many problems left unsolved by the treaty. Nevertheless, he left Europe with a sense of achievement and genuine hope for the future. Reviewing the Versailles experience, he realized that he had made many compromises to reach the final agreement. But in exchange, his covenant for a League of Nations was written into the treaty and accepted by all who had signed it. With this covenant, the treaty itself could eventually be revised by peaceful means, without recourse to war. This was the vision that Wilson brought back from Versailles. Eagerly, Wilson returned to the capital and presented the treaty to Congress, which, to his bitter surprise, rebuffed him. Wilson's political enemies had rallied during his absence abroad. Now they attacked the very heart of the treaty, the League of Nations. Although stunned with disappointment, Wilson didn't lose heart. Never one to retreat from a battle, he picked up the challenge and prepared to fight back. With his faith in the American people unshaken, Wilson decided to take his case to them directly. That meant, in the days before radio and television, setting forth in person on a strenuous tour, meeting the people face to face, and telling them what he believed and why. As he started his swing through the Middle West, the mood of the nation was visible in its people. Curious enough to come out to see their president, they showed little enthusiasm for his ideas, with which they were barely acquainted. Patiently, Wilson explained the great issues of the treaty, in terms everyone could understand. And his words lingered on in their minds, even after he had finished speaking. The heart of humanity beats in this great document. Nations that never before saw the gleam of hope have been liberated by it. Ignoring fatigue and his doctor's advice, Wilson repeated the fervent pleas that by now re-echoed through the land. The isolation of the United States is at an end. Not because we chose to go into the politics of the world, but because by the sheer genius of this people and the growth of our power, we have become a determining factor in the history of mankind. The world is waiting, waiting to see not whether we will take part, but whether we will serve and lead, for it has expected us to lead. With stirring sincerity, he unburdened his conscience to veterans. Boys, I told you before you went across the seas that this was a war against wars. And I did my best to fulfill that promise. 
but I am obliged to come to you in mortification and shame and say I have not been able to fulfill the promise. You are betrayed. You fought for something you did not get. Single-handed, Wilson was turning the tide of national opinion. Heartened by the visible change, he could neither rest nor relent. On September 25th, he arrived at Pueblo, Colorado, where he made perhaps his most eloquent appeal. It always seems difficult for me to say anything when I think of my clients in this case. My clients are the children. My clients are the next generation. They shall not be sent upon a similar errand. My friends, on last Decoration Day, I went to a beautiful hillside near Paris, where was located a cemetery given over to the American dead. Right by the side of the stand where I spoke, there was a little group of French women who had made themselves mothers of those dear ghosts by putting flowers every day on those graves, taking them as their own sons because they had died in the same cause. I wish some men in public life who are now opposing the settlement for which these men died could visit such a spot as that. For nothing less depends on this decision. Nothing less than the liberation and salvation of the world. That same night, having driven himself beyond the limits of his endurance, Wilson collapsed. He was brought back to the capital, where he suffered a severe stroke. With him collapsed all hope of American participation in the league he had conceived and inspired. An invalid, beset by relentless political opponents, Wilson finished his second term of office and retired to a private residence in the capital. Devoted friends and admirers gathered on the occasions of his rare public appearances. But on the whole, the man who had stirred tens of millions was forgotten by all but a few. He did not forget them. His faith unshaken, he still could declare that we shall prevail is as sure as that God reigns. On February 3, 1924, his devoted friend and physician, Admiral Carey Grayson, announced the saddening news. Woodrow Wilson was dead. The man, the mortal, passed on. But thousands of miles from his native soil, a living monument to Wilson's immortal vision arose in Geneva, Switzerland, the embodiment of his dream of a permanent peace the League of Nations. A league of only some nations, it could deal with only some problems. But even in its limited successes, it showed the way and the hope and the danger Wilson had signaled. Without collective resistance to aggression, the League was helpless. Peace was doomed. My clients are the children. My clients are the next generation. The children had grown up. The next generation was here. Here on a similar errand, more difficult, more harrowing than the last time. A human forfeit on the unredeemed pledge of their fathers. Out of this sacrifice, finally, painfully, the fragments of hope were reassembled. Men at last created in a new form the community of power for which Woodrow Wilson had pleaded. The United Nations. A concerted effort of the nations of the world 
to shape their own individual destinies together in harmony with a common aim. What we seek is the reign of law based upon the consent of the governed and sustained by the organized opinion of mankind. Yeah.